Okay, welcome back to the Gunner Travel Channel. This is the part two of Singapore Bicentennial Experience at Fort Canning Center, Singapore. And so, if you haven't watched the part one about the Singapore connection with other part of the world for the past 700 years, you can click the link above. Okay. So, part two is time traveler. So we will go back in time and see how Singapore grow. I would say that the multimedia and live performance is very amazing. Okay. Climate changes do have an impact on the. Start with a little bit story about climate change. You just come forward and move around, take a closer look. The rain is falling in the rivers. Amanda, Singapore. Time traveling has five acts. Starting with Sang Nila Utama arrival in the 13th century. The story of early Singapore, or as it was known back then. Singapore. This is a real life actor performing. Our journey begins 700 years ago. Southeast Asia is a world of winding waterways with ancient empires like Srivijaya and Majapahit. As Sri Vijaya crumbles, a string of port cities rise along the Straits of Malacca. Our story begins with Sang Nila Utama, a young prince from Palembo, sanctified as Sri Tribuana, Lord of the Three Worlds. Exacting revenge by plotting with enemy forces from Majapahit. 
Forced to flee for his life, Iskander Shah heads north, finding refuge in Malacca. Thus, the kingdom of Singapore loses the last of its five kings, dimming the island's first golden age. But Iskander Shah starts afresh by founding the Malacca Sultanate, establishing it as one of the most important in Southeast Asia. As Malacca's fortunes continue to rise, China takes a keen interest in this region, sending Admiral Zheng He to explore opportunities. Ming China formalizes relationships with Malacca and grants it protection from Aoudaya and Majapahit forces. Meanwhile, Singapore grows in strength alongside Malacca as a vital naval base with Orang Lao warriors and powerful cruisers. Halfway across the globe, the rounding of the Cape of Good Hope draws a new wave of voyages to Southeast Asia, signaling the European age of discovery. The Portuguese arrive and seize Malacca in a bloody battle. The Sultanate Court is forced to move to modern-day Johor. Singapore returns to the limelight as a base of anti-Portuguese resistance and also a Sharbandaria, or trading post. Then the Dutch arrive, breaking the Portuguese stronghold in this region. An incident in Macau where 17 Dutch sailors are executed by Portuguese triggers retaliatory attacks. In Singapore, a Dutch explorer named Admiral Jacob van Heemsko ambushes Portuguese ships laden with goods from China and Japan. He prepares an unprecedented plunder of the Santa Catarina, a ship filled with precious cargo of musk, Chinese raw silk, and porcelain. The Santa Catarina and its cargo are taken back to Europe, where it stirs up even greater interest in the wealth and promise of Southeast Asia. The incident opens up relationships between the Dutch and the Johor Sultanate. Watching this battle between the Dutch and the Portuguese is Achi, where the Sultan has been expecting the chaos to worsen to his political advantage. When that does not happen, Achi decides to launch an attack on Johor. Over 20,000 warriors are dispatched by sea to attack Johor and Singapore. The aura of loud warriors in Singapore, fiercely loyal to the Sultan, put up a desperate defense. The Pencaksila performance is very entertaining with the background animation looks so cool. Act 2 retold the story when Sir Stamford Raffles comes to Singapore in 1819. The moving screen and rotating seats are amazing. Singapore continues to flounder, but there are still bouts of curiosity and interest. Since the 17th century, the Dutch have been aggressively building their monopoly in the East Indies. In a bid to break the Dutch stronghold, a 38-year-old British officer from the East India Company set sail into the Eastern Seas on board the Indiana. His name is Stafford Raffles, and he is determined to find that one free port on the sea. Danny Moss from one of the survey ships suggests Singapore as a possible base. Raffles decides to take a look at this seemingly unappealing island. Accompanying Raffles is Major William Fark, who will turn out to be a key player in the events that follow. On 28 January 1819, Raffles and Farker set foot on the island and established ties 
Graphics with Golden Mom, the Domingo. Graphics and Saka craft a treaty of friendship and alliance to formalize British presence on the island. The Singapore Treaty is signed on 6 February at an elaborate ceremony appointing Tung Kulong as the new Sultan of Singapore and permitting the British to set up a trading post on the island. In nine days, Raffles and Farker changed the destiny of the region. And the vision Raffles has of Singapore as a great commercial emporium begins to take shape. Over the next four years, it will be Farker who shapes the growth of Singapore, from clearing mangrove swamps, to constructing aqueducts for water supply, to building roads and bridges. He is also credited with ridding the town of rats. Farker's strategy to invite skilled and enterprising tradesmen works as the Malays and Chinese from Malacca turn up with ducks, chickens and vegetables to sell. While his efforts to clean up and build a new town win the respect and admiration of the migrant settlers, Farker diverges from Raffles' instructions, leading to an eventual falling out between them. Raffles excludes Farker and sets up a committee to look at a plan for development. This leads to the Jackson Plan, named after Lieutenant Philip Jackson, who organizes the settlement and population along an orderly but segregated lines. With the signing of the Anglo-Dutch Treaty in 1824, the Dutch give up their claims to Singapore. Singapore grows exponentially as a free port. Ships come from near and far, bringing wave upon wave of traders, explorers and settlers. Singapore becomes a vibrant marketplace with peoples from everywhere. Inhabitants of the Malay world, the Boyanese, Minangkabaos, Javanese and Bugis arrive alongside the Arabs, Armenians, Jews, South and North Indians, Chinese, Scottish, and the English. In Chinatown, merchants Tan Tok Seng and Xia Yu Qin work alongside Syed Omar Al Juni. Narayana Pillay's construction firm builds Chinese offices and homes. British traders Alexander Guthrie and Edward Brewster work with Chinese and Parsi businessmen, while Tan Kim Chen, the eldest son of Tan Tok Sein, works for Guthrie's firm. Hajar Fatima's vast land holdings are leased to the Chinese businessmen for spice farming. Munshi Abdullah comes from Malacca and is the writer who provides an extensive record of Singapore's early history. It is a golden era for Singapore, the little island of opportunity, and as tomorrow edges closer, the horizon looks brighter and even more promising. Acti captured Singapore after Raffles until 1942. The new Diana is not just a war vessel that helps fight piracy, she is also a symbol of change. Steam engines lead the way for Singapore's age of industrialization and modernity. And when the Suez Canal opens, everything kicks into high gear. Singapore's links to the world get stronger and connectivity and communication more important. Newspapers begin to flourish. One outstanding figure is Yunus Abdullah, first editor of the Utusan Malayu and a major champion for Malay education. In 1923, the causeway opens, bringing a new surge of trade from Malaya. By the time trade services start, Singapore's status as an important hub is seen. With her strategic position and hard-working dog coolies, 
Singapore becomes the perfect global port. Singapore is also a regional center for Muslim pilgrims, led by companies like Alsinoff Steamship. With every new connection comes improvements to city life. Businessman Tan Kim Seng starts an initiative to provide public waterworks and later has a fountain erected in his name. People come from all over, adding their unique cultures to the melting pot. It's a dynamic era for diversity. This cosmopolitan city works hard and plays hard. After work, people flock to bars and nightclubs and the seductive amusement parks. But beneath the shimmer and shine lurk darkness and disquiet. British established and profited from. In a bid to help opium addicts, Dr. Lim Bu Ken, an English educated Straits Chinese leader, starts a rehabilitation center. But the working classes face other social problems prostitution, gambling, malnutrition, and poor sanitation, prompting businessman Tan Jiang Kim to open a medical school. Also attempting to improve conditions is William Pickering, protector of the Chinese. But challenges remain. In 1876, a new safer remittance scheme breaks the Chinese Taoke's monopoly. Seen as colonial profiteering, it sparks violent riot. In 1915, another deadly event shatters Singapore. Sepoy soldiers being redeployed to Hong Kong worry that they will end up fighting fellow Muslims at the Western Front. Fanning this misinformation, coffee shop owner Kasim Mansour and the German prisoner of war Julius Lauterbach trigger off the 1915 Singapore Mutiny. Accounts record that the week-long mutiny results in 49 deaths 56 mutineers killed, and 47 others executed. Even as the Japanese threat loomed abroad, public anxiety is quickly abated when the British dispatch two warships to Singapore. Perhaps there is nothing to worry about. We experience how it's like to be in a bunker at war. Let the marches pass through streets of people with sad and silent faces. It completely changes the way the locals view the British.
no longer seeing them as invincible masters. And how the survival tries to escape a massacre during the Japanese invasion. The moment my knobs came into the contact with the seawater, it became loose and I swept outwards. It clicked in my mind. This is when the firing would start. I took a deep breath and went underwater. And I could hear the bullets negotiating above me. I never knew what a ricocheting bullet sounded like. It went shoo, shoo, shoo above water. When the sound of the motorboat came nearer to me, I stayed underwater. After some time, all became silent. Eventually, the searchlights were off, and I started to swim. The Japanese occupation remains a painful chapter for Singapore. This is the end of Act 4. Act 5 is interesting. We are given an umbrella and it is raining inside the building. The intensity of rain varies during the course of storytelling. Cheaters will feel as they part of Singapore history. Throughout the colonial period, It is August 9th, 1968, and we are here at the Padang, where spectators and contingents are standing in pouring rain. On this great day in March 2015, thousands of everyday Singaporeans have braved heavy rains to pay their last respects to the nation's founding Prime Minister. Rain has always been a part of the Singapore story. Singapore fans here at the stadium and many more watching back home are praising themselves. Will we finally take on the Malaysia Cup? Here is the defining moment. Singapore's favorite footballing son, Fadi Ahmad, through on goal. Fadi! After watching, we are asked to take a short survey about which character traits is the most important for Singapore. Multiculturalism, openness, or self-determination. These are all the votes accumulated the votes for accumulated since the previews started. Okay, overall it is an amazing experience. You can learn Singapore history in a fun way. By using all of these live performance, uh, cutting as multimedia, and also amazing art, it makes us feel present in that moment. If you are in Singapore, you really need to visit this event. From 1st June to 15 September 2019 at Fort Canning Center. It's free, but you need to register online first. Okay, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. And hit the bell icon to get notified when I posted the new video. Thank you!